they speak about a certain light that is very spiritual, right? It's like the, the I think Terrell is a Quaker, is the inner light, and so on and so forth. I come from a different kind of light. Uh, my parents were nightclub owners, and so for me, the light of the discotheque is this kind of stroboscopic, disorienting thing where you can be somebody other than yourself at the club. It confounds you. It's it's this moment of the interruption of who you are. You can hide in the light of the club, or the light of the tracking systems used, for instance, in the helicopters looking for Mexicans at the border or the Minutemen, right? Um, so this violent light of police interrogation, the light that blinds you. So I always work with these two kind of moments, like the moment <coughs> of a party, of participation, of fun, of inclusion, of complicity, and then the violence of identification and predatorial vision and so on and so forth. Why am I saying this? Oh, oh, because the yeah, because the sun is this kind of incredible, you know, sort of icon of how the violence of light is what gives us life, and so on and so forth. Yeah. Sometimes I do completely ridiculous variations of projects. Like this is in an Inquisition church in Mexico City. We made um, a, another solar simulator, but we put a pendulum underneath, and so. You get on the pendulum, you travel 60 feet down the nave of the church while hanging from the simulation. And um, I love Mexico. Uh, it, health and safety would never allow us to do that here or in Canada where I live. Um, but in Mexico, if you get on the pendulum and you fall, <coughs> the security guard comes on and says, are you all right? And then if you say, well, I, my knee, you know, I'm really hurt. And he says, yeah, of course. Well, can't you see? It's like, it goes really high, you know. <laughs> and a lot of common sense is just so great. And then there's a smoke that is generated by the, by the um, interaction. And this smoke accumulates on the top of the dome of the church. All right. Um, I make pieces also for collectors and smaller collections. Um, this one's the same kind of Navier Stokes smoke, um, the piece is called The Year's Midnight. And it's basically a tracking system that removes your eyeballs and replaces them with this bellowing smoke. And then the eyeballs are connected on the bottom of the display. This is inspired by representations of St. Lucy in Baroque painting. So if you remember what happened with St. Lucy, she, the pagan that wanted to marry her or whatever, like want, was always talking about her eyes, so she pulls them out and like gives it to him because she only has eyes for God. Um, so this idea of like who is the observer and who is the observed and the violence of, 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 um, of vision, of, of observing, is what this piece is about. I, I say these things, but of course it's whatever you want them to be. They're, they're, that's what I sort of thought about when I made this project, but people find them uh, fun or weird or whatever, so that's the eyeballs. Um, again, on the idea of this carnival or the idea of things being out of control, this is a project for um, a festival in Santa Monica. I have two sandboxes on uh, these kind of risers, on these stages, and that night, we have very, very powerful projectors which animate the beach. When you put your hand into the sandbox, it's captured by cameras and projected onto the beach <laughs> in a very big scale. But at the same time, we're tracking the people on the beach and we're projecting them inside of the sandbox. So you see those black dots that are moving around? That's the people on the beach. So they see you and you see them and you can reach out and share these three scales. And a project like this is very uncomfortable, it's very expensive, right? It costs like a quarter million dollars to do this kind of thing. And, and the sponsors of the projects, whether private or public, they're always like, they come to the opening and they're like expecting a show and then there's nothing to see. Like there's just the lights go on until like a five-year-old kid with curly hair goes in and starts playing and then everybody starts playing and it becomes something. But it's humbling because the content is not there. The content is entirely derived from whatever people do. And, um, and what people do is just so imaginative. It's really, it's really crazy good. Um, here, let me show you some examples. So we have, um, well, they bring their doggies with boobies. They uh, do also, this guy, for instance, he burns people. 
this guy doesn't want to be burned. <laughs> and you can exchange, right? Like if you're in the beach, then you can take now the position at the sandbox and exchange um, like scales, Coca-Cola guy, and so on. So again, the, the desire is, is for people, you know, that what I was saying about the surveillance image being in this kind of control room in a small scale. Well, what if, what if surveillance, instead of taking images away from us, it gave us images? So there's this, there's this weird kind of hypothesis. You know, our stupid politicians think that the solutions <coughs> to things like security and terrorism is more cameras, right? But everybody knows, anybody with common sense, that the solution is not technological. The solution is culture, and it's diplomacy, and it's politics, and it's economics. It's complicated. It's not going to make it safer to have these cameras. So the theory is, well, what would happen if every single surveillance camera became a projector? What if, instead of taking images away, it gave us images? Opportunities to create community by having you and someone you don't know share an experience. I know it's naive, but that's kind of what we're hoping to do. Um, Voice Tunnel was a, an installation to transform um, the Park Avenue Tunnel in New York City. This is a tunnel that um, covers seven city blocks. It had never been open to the pedestrians. And um, I think especially in a place like New York, it's very important to allow people to take over their infrastructure. Because as you know, it's, uh, it's a location that is, um, well, very uh, controlled. So in this piece, there is an um, intercom, like a microphone in the middle of the tunnel, where you make a voice message. And this voice message loops, and it creates an archway of light. Then each archway of light pushes the previous ones one position. And there is 300 voices simultaneously in the tunnel. With their, you can hear them also, 300 channels of sound. So as you walk, you hear the voices of New Yorkers. And, um, and it's kind of, um, when I was negotiating to make this project in New York, um, as a funny story, is I had a meeting with NYPD, and they asked me, Rafael, you know, we're gonna have to consider putting a six second delay, because in case somebody says something that's offensive or whatever. And then I did a thing that's a Mexican Canadian I've always wanted to do, I saw it in the films, I said, this is America, and it is your job to protect freedom of speech. And, uh, and they kind of looked at each other like, okay, but, <laughs> you, know, was, you know, they were just trying to be helpful. Um, um, but I was very proud that there was no censorship. Um, later speaking to them, I, I mean, this happened uh, not many months after the Boston Marathon bombing. So what they were concerned about is we had 10,000 people in the, the tunnel. So what they were worried about is that someone would shout fire or bomb or whatever. And so I understood that. So what we did is we made a button, uh, which was controlled by a docent who is a freedom of speech uh, activist. And she would press, if somebody said something like that, she would press the button and automatically we replace that particular offensive or, or problematic voice with Lori Anderson or Kathy Acker or you know some voices that we had pre-recorded there. I'm very proud to say that in throughout the month uh, that we showed this project, the button was never pressed once. And we had lots of marriage, again, marriage proposals people like to. Um, and she said yes, so then their <laughs> memories went together and then they left the tunnel, it was fun. So, um, what else? Um, so this is a, a clock that measures time, not in minutes and seconds, but in um, internet collected statistics. So the idea is that you can meet in 20 minutes or 121,000 beers, um, or fire my arms, or abortions, or or, you know, oranges. Um, and the project's called Zero Noon because at noon, all of the um, statistics zero. And then it's always measured from noon. And this project is inspired by the Cathars. You know, if the Cathars were the um, heretics in southern France who used to measure distance, not by meters or whatever, feet or whatever. They measured it with that number of raindrops that would hit a traveling soul. Mm -hmm. So if you were a Cathar, um, and you ask, well, what's the distance between Lyon and Toulouse? They'd say, well, 712 raindrops. And you go, okay. So what's the distance between Lyon and Barcelona? as well, 2,100 raindrops. And everyone's like, okay, I know. I know what that is because, uh, you know, time is this kind of uh, 
convention, right? So we can measure time in different ways. So this is zero noon is a clock that does that, but with some of them are very disturbing statistics. So, you know, one of them might be, for instance, you know, I don't know, a journalist assassinated. So every time that the the hand of the clock reaches noon, somebody just got murdered. Um, this is an asphyxiation chamber. It's called vicious circular breathing. And it's basically a hermetically sealed chamber that invites people to breathe the air that has already been breathed by everybody before them. So here's how it works. You press a button and you enter a decompression chamber where all the fresh air goes away. There's two valves in the top left. Don't move it. Once the fresh air is gone, another set of doors opens up and you're welcome into a larger chamber, glass chamber, where you breathe this stale air. It's really disgusting. <laughs> I would never go into it, except I was the first guy to go in. And then <laughs> others go in. And it wasn't, I didn't think that people would go and sit there, but they do. Um, and as you breathe, your air leaves through these tubes which connect your, this, the chamber with bellows, which create pressure and vacuum. And then those bellows um, are, are um, 